Good morning. I feel the church is tilting this way. You're you are winning. Yeah. Although the choir, no, maybe not. Maybe it's, maybe it's down. Welcome. I'm grateful that we are here together to worship. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to uh, think about God and praise God and I'm grateful especially if you're worshiping here for the first time uh, welcome be sure to write your name on the attendance pad and give us contact information so we may reach out to you but I'm grateful that we are here, all here together um, we have a day full of activity today so I want to give an opportunity for a couple of announcements um, is Leah here yet thank you I was here early enough and I'm sorry, I didn't no, mean it like that. It sounded like, well, she did yet. No, it's very fair. Good morning. Um, my name is Leah Jackman Whitener, and I am uh, co chairing a committee that's been working on engaging young adults, and it is sponsoring some events and some things that are open to all ages. So, um, you know, birth to still here. Please come this coming Saturday. On the back of your bulletin, you see the full flyer, um, Faithfully Moving from Crisis to Response, Climate Change and Creativity. Abby Mohop, who's actually a colleague and friend of Marietta's, is going to be here um, from Texas to talk about climate change. And this morning in Sunday School, we're going to talk about, um, kind of start that conversation. She sent us a video that she wants us to watch, and then we're going to have a conversation. A the way I feel is a bunch of people in this congregation are really on board with climate change issues and sustainability in ways that I'm not. So I think it'd be great to just, let's have a conversation. What matters to you? What do you do to protect the earth? What do you do to make sure you're doing good things for the world? And I plan on learning a lot from everyone who's here. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. In preparation for our upcoming youth activities for this next summer, we have a couple of fundraisers that we're starting today. So you all are welcome to support um, the youth. This will go towards mission trips. If we go to um, a, like the middle school conference like we did this year, any of those kinds of things that the youth may do in the summer. So in, a, in a, a reward for you supporting us, we're having a bake sale this morning in the gym. So any donation, uh, no matter what size that you would like to offer, you're free to pick up some treats in the gym. The kids and some generous adults have brought those in. We also have, and Julie is modeling it this morning, we have t-shirts for sale. These are the same ones that we wore this summer on the mission trips and for Youth Sunday that we designed them for. Um, and we have a few extras, so the kids went ahead and tie-dyed those, so they are custom design, one-of-a-kind art pieces that are for sale in the gym also to support the, the youth and their mission trips and all those awesome experiences you all know that we have. So thank you for helping support us in, in those ways. Other announcements this morning? Friends, routine, routinely when we start worship, we think about baptism because we remember that baptism is our welcome into the body of Christ. But within the tradition of the church, we also think about when we die, we complete our baptism because that is the time when God embraces us fully. And so today I'm going to uh, ha have us remember a church member who passed away on Friday. Steve Hollinger passed away this Friday. His service will take place this coming Friday uh, in, in a funeral home. I don't have all the details just yet, but it'll be Friday morning. So they'll be viewing on Thursday night and on Friday morning. So in the spirit of understanding that Steve has completed his baptism, I invite us all to stand. We will have a moment of silent prayer, and then I'll invite you to pass the peace. Let us pray. God, in your mercy, you 
bless the life of Steve Hollinger and his wife Kim. And in this time of grief and, and of uh, distress, we ask for your comfort to be present in her life and the life of their children. God, we give you thanks for Steve's witness and for the way in which he touched the lives of many. And we are grateful, loving God, that you receive him into your arms. We ask, O Lord, that you allow us to be mindful of the ways in which we are participating in the journey of faith of people around us. And we give you thanks for Steve's faithful witness. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Also with you. Please share signs of Christ's peace with one another.
open our hearts to God in confession. Join me as we pray. Wise and loving God, we try to do your will, yet we confess that it's not always easy. In the Bible, Jacob wrestled with someone. Was it an angel? Because he was conflicted about what to do. We also struggle with decisions, even when we might know what you have us do. We toss and turn. Please bring calm to our hearts. Bring peace to our minds. Help us struggle less and be patient as we seek to follow you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. The God with whom we struggle is the God who lovingly and patiently parents us. In God we find our way. In God we find our rest. In Christ we find forgiveness and grace, no matter what we wrestle with. Thanks be to God. Children are welcome to join me up front on the steps. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. How many of you, if I ask, have ever struggled with something? What do you think of when you hear the word struggle? Sarah, you're nodding your head. Have you struggled with something? Do you want to share what that is? Homework. I thought that might be one of the things that we would struggle with. Anybody else? Quizzes or tests at school? What about you guys? Have you struggled with something? When you're confused? Big Lego sets, yes. Sometimes you struggle with those. Have you struggled with something, Maddie? Really oh, going on really long bike rides, yeah. That, that's a pretty good example of a struggle. So for those of you maybe who are still thinking, struggling if you got an idea from what they or our other friends have said, it's when you're trying really, really hard, like when you're wrestling with something, but kind of like inside. So when you have a really hard test at school or when you're on a long bike ride, and you're just trying to figure it out. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to give up. And that's what the story in the Bible today that God wants us to remember teaches us that we have our friends. Some of us have learned about him, Jacob, whose name gets changed to Israel. He wrestles with an angel and maybe God. So he struggles and he struggles and he struggles and he doesn't give up, just like with the things that you all mentioned. And in the end, God says, that is how you should be. Even when you have really hard things that happen in your life or really um, hard things that happen to other people and you struggle with them, don't give up because God is still with us and God loves us and sends us all these friends to help us. So will you all pray with me, please? God, we thank you for being with us when we struggle, whether it's on a test at school, on a long bike ride, or when we're just confused about things. Help us when we struggle, remember that you love us and don't want us to give up. We ask all these things in your many names. Amen. All right, 
So everybody second grade and under is welcome to go to Sunday school. And everybody older than that will have Sunday school after church. Last week I mentioned to you that the biblical characters for that particular Sunday, Abraham and Sarah, were complex characters. They were people who had done good things and people who had done things that were not good. Well, Jacob, the character we read about today, is uh, a lot less complex. He's just terrible. <laughs> he's a cheater. He's a liar. He takes advantage of people. He sometimes himself bears the brunt of him himself being cheated. And yet God chooses him again and again and again to do God's work. And is in fact a key part of this long lineage of people of God whom God had chosen. It's almost like Jacob is the anti-hero you find yourself rooting for when you're watching a movie or reading a book. And we keep wondering, why does God like him so much? The biggest consequence of his cheating was when he impersonated his older twin, Esau, to steal a blessing from their blind father with the help of their mother. Esau, the twin brother, found out about it and then wanted to kill his brother Jacob. Quite literally, and so Jacob fled. He ran away from home and had not returned for a long, long time. Well, the passage that we read today comes after God had called Jacob to return home. And Jacob wasn't very keen on doing it, but Jacob does. In this passage is the night before Jacob is to meet again Esau. The twins had not seen each other since Esau had threatened to kill Jacob. Jacob had heard God calling him and was coming back, but he was terrified. Now, this particular passage comes at a time when there's a lot of confusion happening. He, Jacob is very afraid, and then this mysterious thing happens, which we have often referred to as Jacob wrestling with the angel. Listen to this passage. It comes from Genesis 32, verses 9 to 13. I'm reading from the contemporary English version. <clears throat> then Jacob prayed, You, Lord, are the God who was worshipped by my grandfather Abraham and my father Isaac. You told me to return home to my family, and you promised to be with me and to make me successful. I don't deserve all the good things you have done for me, your servant. When I first crossed the River Jordan, I had only my walking stick, but now I have two large groups of people and animals. Please, rescue me from my brother. I am afraid he will come and attack not only me, but my wives and my children as well. But you have promised that I would be a success and that someday it would be as hard to count my descendants as it is to count the stars in the sky. After Jacob had spent the night there, he chose some animals as gifts for Esau. He was sending them ahead, sort of as bribes, to sort of blunt the force of Esau's anger. And Jacob got up in the middle of the night and took his wives, his 11 children, sorry, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok River. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the men saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then Jacob said, then the angel said, 
let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. you know it that this is the passage I get to preach on after a whole week of dealing with hip pain. <laughs> a little over a week ago I injured myself while I was doing marathon training and at this point it has made me pause and now change my training before the October race and I've gone to a physical therapist. I don't know if I'm going to be able to run it or not. I was looking forward to it so much though. 
But as I have come to understand as a long distance runner, part of training is about training your mind for the challenge ahead. It's not just the body we train. And so, so much of the training of the mind is about growing in patience and learning your limits and the ability to push yourself or talk yourself into making it just one more block or that one more mile when you're running low on gas. I, I look at the Bible story today and I think of Jacob's injury sort of like a running injury but in a different way. He had been running away from doing what was right all his life. He gets injured as part of that. Jacob gets his hip injury when he is involved in an internal struggle, struggle because the consequence of his bad behavior were finally catching up to him. And specifically, he had decided to stop running away and to finally make things right with his brother, his twin brother Esau, or so it seemed. The passage, as I mentioned, is in, includes this mysterious bit of scripture. It, it, it makes little sense. It's a wrestling scene. You know, if, if God was trying to talk to Jacob, God had spoken to Jacob in many ways before, had spoken to Jacob in dreams and in visions. Why wasn't God doing that then? So we have to understand, we, we, would, have to, we would have understood it if God had decided to use one of those methods to speak to Jacob, maybe through a dream. But when we're reading this particular passage, it's presenting it to us like something that was all too real for him. What sets up the wrestling match is that Jacob had finally obeyed God and had gone back home. But as I mentioned, returning home meant facing his twin brother Esau, who had vowed to kill him. And so Jacob is sending word ahead of his crew up ahead, sending uh, uh, some servants to go talk to Esau and let him know that his brother was coming, trying to gauge the reaction, trying to sort of soften the blow of the news. And wouldn't you know it, Esau immediately takes up 400 men and heads out to catch, uh, to intercept Jacob on his way to him. Oh, that sounded really bad. And Jacob thinks that this will be the end. And so he sends again some presence and, and bribes and tries to soften the blow. Appease Jacob. Appease Esau. And then Jacob has this terrible night before the, night, before the time when he would meet his brother again. It's like a nightmare. It's like all of the wrong things that, that he had done are finally weighing on his heart. He set himself apart from the rest of his family just to be alone with his thoughts and that makes sense, really. Jacob had been selfish all of his life, so really he was always out on his own, or at least out for himself. It makes sense that the night before he feared his brother would kill him, that he would have a, a sleepless night. Only, we're surprised to read that he wasn't alone at all. There was a man there somehow. And before they know it, they're wrestling with each other. They're tangled up the entire night. As I read that passage, I wonder, was Jacob's will faltering? I mean, he doesn't have a really good track record, this guy. His name, the origins of his name, the, the name means literally someone who grabs by the heel because when they were born, and Esau was born first, Jacob is born by grabbing the heel from his brother so that he is born that way, There's that moment of struggle. Metaphorically, his name means the one who supplants, or the trickster. So with a name like Cheater, what do you expect from the guy? If Jacob is getting more and more afraid as the night falls, I could totally see how he would think to throw his family under the bus and to leave one more time. To let them deal with his murderous brother and to start over somewhere. I don't want to make him, I don't want to sell him short, but, but I do wonder. Because in that wrestling scene, there seems to be more going on. So if it is, if it is an internal struggle, 
We can think of it akin to like when we say that somebody's wrestling with their own demons. I get that, but I argue here that I think he's wrestling with a better part of himself. He is trying, maybe for the first time, to do the right thing. He is preparing himself for this reckoning with his brother in as humble a way as he can. When he sends the, his own servants ahead to, to meet Esau, he has them refer to him as Esau's servant. He is not gathering a small army to protect himself in anticipation. He is by himself. This wrestling match, which I can picture sort of internally, tradition has given us as something to interpret as a physical thing that happened, and more than that, that it was a, a struggle with an angel of God. Maybe the angel was there to make sure that Jacob followed through <laughs> with his promise. The story tells us that the struggle took place at night, and it was all night, and it acknowledged that there was tension within Jacob as to what to do next. And strangely, as if the whole wrestling scene wasn't strange enough already, the angel was barely up to the task because he has a hard time beating Jacob, can't defeat him outright, so the, the angel touches Jacob on the hip and puts it out of joint. Yikes. And even so, Jacob won't let him go. He clings to him. So losing the wrestling match but clinging to the angel, then Jacob says, I'll make you a deal. I'll let you go if you bless me. I know that sounds strange to our ears, but blessings are such an important part of the, of the scriptures and, and they, have, they carry so much weight and meaning. But it has an echo to another blessing. Remember I told you that he stole the blessing for his brother? That he had cheated his dad, his blind father, and tricked him into thinking that he was his older brother. So that whole thing about asking for a blessing is really just wrought with tension. But it is a defining moment for this trickster, for Jacob. Because the, the angel gives him a new name. So basically, Mr. Cheater Cheater Pumpkin Eater <laughs> gets that brilliant new name, Israel. The name means God prevails. The angel says, you're getting that name because you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. That is a big deal. The symbolic power of getting a new name is something that I don't think we can appreciate in our current culture. But then Jacob slash Israel wasn't done. He wants to know, who is this person I'm fighting with? Charles, Charles Wesley, the brother of Methodist founder John Wesley, is the writer of the poem that is the anthem that the choir sang. Charles Wesley imagines that conversation between Jacob and the angel, imagines that wrestling match. As in, 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 in his poem, it is for him the realization that Jacob slash Israel had been fighting with God, and God was finally going to get Jacob, Israel, to amend his ways. So, he asks a question. Tell me your name. And Charles Wesley imagines the question this way. Tell me if thy name is love. Here is that verse, different tune. Tis love, tis love, thou dost for me. I hear thy whisper in my heart. The morning breaks, the shadows flee. Pure universal love thou art. To me, to all thy mercies move. Thy nature and thy name is love. To me, to all thy mercies move. Thy nature and thy name is love. I need that verse to make sense of this story. 
Because if I hear it like that, the name Israel is more about God prevailing than Jacob prevailing. It's love who wins. It's justice who wins. It's honesty who wins. No longer will this cheater exist, but now is a new person shaped by love. Israel will go on to meet his brother, who, by the way, had long since forgiven him, but had not had the opportunity to tell him. In that very next passage in the scriptures, the scene echoes that of the prodigal son, because Israel comes and falls at the feet of his brother, sure that he's going to get it, and Israel lifts him up, embraces him, and forgives him. We each carry scars and limps from our internal struggles with God, our internal struggles with ourselves. God wants to hold our hand and we insist on arm wrestling God instead. That's the eternal struggle of humans and God. We try to assert who will prevail. We have had those long nights that tossing and turning, those long periods alone with a defining moment in our lives just around the corner. And what God is asking us is to realize that God prevails. That no matter how much we try to, in the end, God's love prevails. And so God asks us to turn our willfulness into faithfulness. The journey might not turn out as we would have predicted or hoped for. We may even be painfully sidelined momentarily. But this is a long journey. This is, this is a long run. There's time for God to do God's work in us and through us, maybe even in spite of us. And that scar or that limp will remind us, not that we lost, but that God will show us that even when we put up a fight, God is there. Thanks be to God for God's word for us. Amen. Up to God joyfully. Let us pray. 
We are so grateful that you guide us, loving God, even when we initially resist your guidance. Open our hearts to your will and let our efforts bear fruit as we offer our time, talents, and treasure this day. In Christ we pray, amen. Oh 
seated. As we pray with and for one another, we remember people in our lives who are going through a difficult time. Uh, Liz Dom is asking us to pray for her husband Jason and for his parents, Carmen and Randy Dom, uh, because they have recently lost several friends and family members to cancer. So I invite your prayers for Jason, Carmen, Randy uh, in their time of grief. As we mentioned before, we pray for the family of Stephen Hollinger, who passed away on Friday, uh, his wife Kim and daughters Chandra and Tori. We ask for your uh, prayers for them, and as I mentioned, the service will take place in the funeral home uh, on Friday. I want to let you know that Dee Dee Apps is doing well. Uh, she is our 99-year-old member who decided to have a heart attack the other day. Uh, she is doing okay. They put in a stent. She, we got to see her before and after the, uh, the stent was placed. And she's just in good spirits and feels and looks strong. Uh, she is recovering at Four Seasons. Uh, I know that family were here, uh, family members were here, her daughter was here. So we invite your, thought, your prayers for her and if you pay her a visit. She is not at home, she is at Four Seasons. And we give God thanks and celebrate uh, the 50th anniversary of Janet and Ted Sharp. They celebrated their wedding anniversary uh, with a party yesterday, and we just give God thanks for both of them and for not just their family, but for their contribution to this congregation. Join me as we pray. Eternal God, we are locked sometimes in a struggle with you or with ourselves about what happens in our lives or direction that we need to take and time and again what you do is you try to reach out to us and hold our hands and guide us and, and we seem to struggle with that and we we are oh lord not always ready to hear your guidance remind us god that you are the one that prevails you are the one who will guide us and teach us the way even when that way will bring with it scars or limps. We are mindful, loving God, for we are mindful of the people in our congregation and in our families who struggle currently. Maybe they struggle with an illness or with the surgery, recovery from a surgery, struggle with anticipating what will come next or the uncertainty of a job ending. God, you are with us always. Remind us of that. Remind us that we are in your hands. And remind us that you send angels to us, not to wrestle with us, but to guide us and support us. That you send us as, as messengers to one another to encourage, to visit with, to bring casserole, to sit with us in silence and wait. God, we give you thanks for all those people you sent in our, into our lives who help us with those difficult nights, with those difficult struggling moments. May we remember that in their presence you were present for us. We pray this using the words that Jesus taught his disciples as together we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Beloved, in the midst of the struggle, God is with us. In the thick of that struggle, remember that it is God who prevails. Remember that it is God whose name is love, who shares that with us and channels it, channels it through us. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion in the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you now and always. And God's people say, Amen.